We continue on this morning in our study in Romans, and Romans chapter 8, I know, is a favorite for many of us. And this morning, we draw that journey through Romans 8 to Paul's very climactic close. There was a study done in England several years ago that said that small children, on average, ask 73 questions a day. Some of you parents of small children are saying that's an underestimate by the Brits. They need to raise that a little bit. 73 questions a day. The article went on to say children asking those questions, half of which parents struggle to answer, leaving questioning parents in despair. And I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy, in despair. Here, here are some questions that children like to ask. Why do I need two eyes to only see one thing? <laughs> if I don't have a birthday party, how will you know I'm growing up? During school pickup, one mother was asked, where's your school, mama? How come you never take me there? Or a, a little girl who was learning about animals asked, Where's my tail? <laughs> Another little girl who'd been admonished by her mother uh, about her behavior with the question, where are your manners, responded, Mama, where do you keep my manners? <laughs> and then my favorite of the ones I found, Daddy, why do you have a beard under your arms? <laughs> The questions children like to ask. Some of them you really can't answer well, right? Well, Paul has been talking to us. He's really been arguing that Jesus' followers are secure, that God is at work for good in the lives of his followers, and he will complete that work. But he anticipates questions. Questions like, but, but isn't this really too good to be true, Paul? I mean, how do you really know this is going to happen? Sure, I, I can get it that God's not going to fail, but what if I fall short? What if I fail? And Paul kind of anticipates those kinds of questions. And so he begins in chapter 8, verse 31, asking a series of questions. Questions with unquestionable answers. And depending on your translation, you may have more questions than, than what is in the ESV because Greek didn't really have punctuation. And so scholars read these a little bit differently, but I think all of those questions, however many your translation may have, really boil down to three very crucial questions questions that we can ask from this text that Paul asks and Paul answers. These are questions which he gives unquestionable answers to which show our security in Jesus Christ if you are a follower of Jesus. And so with me this morning, beginning at chapter 8, verse 31, think about these questions and then look at the answers that Paul gives to us. The first question is, will God ever give up on me? I have to be honest. If I were God, I'd give up on me sometimes. I'd look down and I'd say, man, there he is getting impatient again. Ugh, I give up. Or there he is getting discouraged again. I give up. If I were God, I, I would give up on me. And I'd probably give up on most of you too because we fail. So when we fail, is God going to give up on us? Just because God saved us, does that mean he really will finish his work? I know, Paul, you said he's going to finish it. Really on me? And Paul's answer is no. God will never give up on me. He will never give up on you if you are one of his children. God is for us. He is on our side and then he says, you want evidence of that? Here's the evidence. His plan proves that he is for us. 
Paul says, what shall we say to these things? And so the question is, what are these things? Well, immediately before this is everything we looked at last week. So Paul may well be saying, what shall we say to the fact that God foreknew us before eternity or in eternity past, before time began, and that he will ultimately glorify us, that that's certain. What shall we say to this? Or Paul may be going further back. He may be reflecting on everything we've studied up to this point in Romans 1 through 8. And he may be saying, in light of all of the work of Christ, what he has done for us in redeeming us and justifying us, in light of all of that, what shall we say? It's really the same thing. Paul is thinking about God's great work, his plan. And he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And that last part of the question, we might say, well, there are a lot of people against me. I mean, I have, I have people who are mistreating me. I have a disease that I'm battling with. I have situations in my life. My finances aren't good. Uh, I'm struggling with temptation. I've got a lot of things against me. But that's not the whole question, is it? If God is for us, then who can be against us and succeed? If you were to say to me, I want you to go to Chicago I want you to pick the most dangerous part of town, and I want you to walk through that part of town at 3 o'clock in the morning. I would say, you are absolutely crazy. There's no way I'm going to do that. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot one detail. I want you to walk through the streets of Chicago at 3 in the morning, but I want you to walk through with SEAL Team 6 fully armed around you. Okay, no problem. I'll do that. Because it's not about me, it's about the protection that I have. And that's Paul's point. Sure, we can see a lot of things that we would think or a lot of people that are against us and struggles that we're having, but they're not going to succeed because God is for us. How do we know he's for us? Look back at the verses right before this or look back at the first eight chapters of the book. God's plan demonstrates that he is for us. He goes on in verse 32 and he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's not just God's plan that proves he is for us. God's greatest gift proves that he is for us. The gift of God, of His Son, given to us, as Paul has said earlier in Romans, he wants us to remember, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. That phrase, who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, is pregnant with meaning. We could probably camp there for the rest of the morning, but we won't. But notice with me, God did not spare His own Son. His own Son. And I remind you that Jesus asked to be spared in the garden. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. But he did ask. He asked the Father, spare me. And the Father said, no. Because if I spare you, I can't spare all those human beings that will come to faith through you. So Jesus asked to be spared, but God did not spare his own son. In fact, the idea of his own son, but gave him up for us, that language perhaps makes us reflect back. It's intended to, to the story of Abraham with his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Abraham takes his only son up that mountain, ready to sacrifice him to God. And the angel of the Lord stops him at the last moment. But there was no stopping at the cross of Calvary. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up, surrendered him over to death for us all. That's important. Paul has spent a lot of time in the first part of Romans pointing out that it doesn't matter who we are, Jew, Gentile, quote-unquote good, quote-unquote bad, Whoever we are, we all need a Redeemer, and God has provided one, His own Son, every one of us. 
We could be tempted to think, well, sure, God saved the really important people, and, and I'm just kind of an afterthought. For those of you who like sports, you know, I'm that proverbial player to be named later. Not even important enough to be named in the deal, but that's not what Paul says. He says he gave him up for every one of us who placed our faith in him. We may not think we're important, but we are in God's eyes. He loved us enough to give his son for us. And since God gave up Jesus for us, why would he ever give up on us? I'm going to say that again because I want you to lock that into your head, into your mind. Since God gave up Jesus for us, why would he ever give up on us? That's Paul's point. God gave us the greatest gift, and if he gave us the greatest gift, why in the world would he ever throw us away? He argues from the, the, the greater to the lesser. If he gave us the most important, the biggest thing, he'll give us the little thing. Like a child in a story that's trapped in a burning building and a man is walking by and he sees the fire and he bursts in the building and he rescues the child, but the child's family is killed. And this man then pays for the child's hospital care and when he's recovered from the burns and the smoke inhalation, he takes him home and then he begins the process of adopting him and takes him into his family and cares for him and loves him and is providing for him. And one day he walks in the room and he sees the little boy holding a sock in tears. And he says, what, son, what's, what's wrong? And the little boy says, I got a hole in my sock and I don't know where I'll get another one. And the father wants to say, I've, I, I've given you everything. I rescued you. I helped you get healed. I've adopted you into my family. I have provided for you. Why in the world do you think I wouldn't give you a sock? And yet how often do we do that with God? Who has redeemed us at the cost of his son rescued us from the fires of hell, adopted us into his family, and, and then we get in some difficult situation and we feel like, well, God's not going to take care of us. He probably has given up on me because I've blown it so many times. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously, God's grace, Paul's emphasized that in the book, give us all things, now, please be careful there. We need to interpret all things in context. That phrase has occurred before, right? We know that in all things, God is at work for good. This is not a blank check. This is not a, okay, God didn't spare his son. He saved me. Therefore, I can name it and claim it. I can ask God for a Tesla, and he's going to have it in the parking lot by the end of the service. That's not what this verse is saying. It's saying in the light of what Paul has written that God has revealed here, God will give us everything we need to accomplish two things, our good, our becoming like Christ, and God's glory. That's what all things work together for good, for our good in becoming like Christ and for bringing glory to God through that process. God will never give up on us he's for us and i have there god is for and i've got a blank because if you're a child of god i want you to put your name in that blank and in just a minute i want you to say it with me here in the worship center i want you over in connections to do it as well so we'll say god is for and then you say your name don't say my name you say your name if you're a child of god all right on three one two three God is for Bill Abernathy. And I want you to remember that. And I want you to leave here this morning saying, you know what, God, if I'm his child, God's not out to get me. He is for me. That doesn't mean that he doesn't sometimes have to chasten us and discipline us like we have to with our earthly children. But he does it because he's for us. He loves us. There is a character in the uh, relatively new Toy Story 4. His name is Forky. You can see why. He's made out of a spork. And he's just made out of a craft the little girl makes him. And because he's just made out of this other stuff, he thinks he's just trash. 
And so at the beginning of the movie, I'm not going to ruin the plot for you, but at the beginning of the movie, he keeps trying to go back to the trash because he's just trash. And a lot of times that's how we see ourselves because we know our hearts, we know our sin, we know the times we've failed God, we know the times we've hurt other people, and we say, I'm just trash. And so in this movie, Woody has to convince Forky that he's not trash. And one of the ways he does it, and we've seen this through the Toy Story movies, is to point out Bonnie's name is on you. You're a toy, you're not trash. If you're a child of Jesus Christ, Jesus' name, the Father's name is on you. You have been adopted into his family. And though you may sometimes feel like you are worthless, you are never worthless because you are a child of God important to him. And he is cheering you on and he is lifting you up and he is loving you when no one else loves you. And if you've wandered away from him, he is maybe bringing difficult things into your life to call you back to him. But he wants you to come back to him. And if you're not a child of God, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, I want you to understand today that the greatest gift possible, the very gift of God's Son's life was given so that you could have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You could belong to God through Jesus Christ, that God could be for you, not against you, because you are one of his family. Before you leave here today, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ, talk to somebody about that need and allow us to help you understand how you can know God will never give up on you because he's for you. That's the first question that Paul asks and answers in this passage. The second question is, can anyone condemn me before God? That is, people, and especially Satan. Think of, for those of you who are familiar with it, of the story of Job in the Old Testament, how Job is, is accused before God by Satan. Satan and other people are really pretty quick to point out the faults, the flaws, the failures, the sins in my life and yours. Is God going to agree with that? Is God going to condemn us when, when other people call for God to condemn us? Paul says, no. No, the verdict is in. The most important verdict in all of history has already been given by God himself. Look at verse 33 with me. Who shall bring any charge, any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies and we have talked, as Paul has discussed it in this book, about justification. The idea that God looks at us and he not only sees us as not guilty, but he sees us as positively righteous. So the verdict is already in, it's already been settled. God has already looked at us and said, not guilty and absolutely righteous in the righteousness of Christ. So whoever brings an accusation against us is bringing an accusation that cannot possibly stick because we've been declared by God himself to be justified, to be righteous because of the work that Jesus Christ did for us. Sometimes politicians are accused of, of being Teflon, you know, that, that charges are lobbed at them, but they just kind of slide right off. That's not what Paul is saying about us. He's saying the charges against us may very well be true, but Jesus Christ's righteousness, his death on the cross, has already paid for them and covered them in the eyes of God. And that's what he goes on to tell us in verse 34 when he says, God has made us righteous in the eyes of God, and he has done that through the work of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 34, he says, who is to condemn? Same question, really. Who can accuse us? Who can condemn us? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Paul wants us to understand that the completed work of Jesus Christ completely answers all accusations against us. 
Every accusation that could be answered. Satan stands before God and he says, look at Bill Abernathy. Look at how he got upset the other day. And, and God says, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I look at him and I see him as righteous. And Satan throws up an accusation against you. Look at, look at what they did with their finances. Look at how they behaved toward their spouse. Look how they behaved toward their parents. And God says, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They're righteous in my eyes through the righteousness of Christ. Notice how he defines the completed work of Christ here. He died for our sins. Think back to all we've seen in Romans. Our sin is removed. Our guilt is gone. He has risen from the dead, which demonstrates that his one-time payment was sufficient for all of my sins and your sins. He's seated in the place of power and authority at the very right hand of God, the Father himself. And then right now, present tense verb, he indeed is interceding for us. Remember earlier in chapter 8? The Holy Spirit is interceding for us. Now he says the, the Son, Jesus, is interceding for us as well right now. It's the day before Jesus goes to the cross. He's talking to his disciples. And he says to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. Boy, that's not good news. And then he says, but I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And when you have returned, not if, when? Why is it when? Because Jesus prayed for him. Strengthen your brothers. Jesus, who prayed for Peter, who restored Peter, is praying for you and he's praying for me. And as we go through the difficulties of life, as there are accusations thrown against us by the tempter or by other people, we can look and say, my security is not grounded in what I can do. It's not grounded in what I have done. It's not even grounded in the good I might do in the future. My security is grounded in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He died. He was buried. He rose. He ascended. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and He's interceding for me. That is my security. And folks, that's your security as well. Because you see, we need to come to grips with the fact that no one no one can condemn us before God. The verdict has already been given by God himself. We may feel like a failure. We may think God sees us as a failure, but he doesn't. He is for us. And he sees us as righteous. Now our sin, when we do it, does hurt our fellowship with God. And it may bring discipline, chastening by him out of love and a desire to correct us, but it never changes our right standing before God. But if you're not one of God's children, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then none of what I have just said is true about you. You actually do stand condemned before God, guilty of sin and rebellion against God him and destined for judgment forever in hell but there's good news the good news is that your sins can be paid for by the work of jesus christ if you will place your faith and trust in what he did for you on the cross and you will turn from your sin we call that repentance and will turn your life over to god then you too can be absolutely righteous, not in who you are, but in who Jesus Christ is. Will God ever turn away from us? No, he's for us. Can anyone condemn us before God? No, because God has already given the verdict and the trial is over and we are righteous in Christ because of what Christ did. And then Paul asks another question. Can any power divorce me from God? And that word divorce has a lot of emotional connotations, but I'm going to explain to you in just a minute why I used that word. 
The question is really, with everything that can happen in my life, can someone or something keep me from reaching heaven? Can any power divorce me from God? And Paul's answer again is a resounding no. No, his love is unbreakable. Probably every one of us in the room, every one of us watching online or in connections has experienced the breaking of a relationship, the breaking of of a relationship with somebody who said they loved us. We never experienced that with God. In fact, what Paul wants us to understand is all of those things that come into our life that we're concerned that they can break God's love for us, we can have, in fact, we do have abundant victory in all of life's hardships. And Paul knew hardships. A few weeks ago, we looked at his testimony in 2 Corinthians 11, where he talks about being shipwrecked and being beaten with rods and being beaten with stripes and being hungry and being lost on the the face of the ocean. All of those things, Paul knew them. And yet he says, we have abundant victory in every one of those hardships. Look at verse 35. That's where he describes it. Who shall separate us, or we could say what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? That that word tribulation is the idea of being squeezed by outer circumstances, and, and distress is kind of being squeezed by inner circumstances, and My mind sometimes works in odd ways. And as I was reading that and thinking about it this week, I had this mental picture come into my head. And I I looked for the same thing on, on the Internet. I couldn't find the exact same machine. But here's a close proximity. When I was growing up, we had a juicer, something like this. And I loved to use that thing. You'd cut an orange or a grapefruit in half and you'd lay it pulp side down and you'd bend that handle down and just squeeze the living daylights out of that fruit. And it would produce juice that was really good. But somehow when I was studying this week, that's what came to mind because sometimes I think you and I feel like that piece of orange or piece of grapefruit and somebody's putting the pressure on and we are really being squeezed hard by external factors or maybe by things going on inside us and, and, and juice is coming out all over the place and we're a mess and Paul says that doesn't separate us from the love of God his love's unbreakable Paul goes on to talk about some other things like hunger famine nakedness not having clothes being in peril in, in danger or the sword, all related back to the word he uses before those, persecution. When you're being persecuted, pursued for your faith, you may not have enough to eat, you may not have enough to wear, you are certainly in danger, and the sword may catch up to you, you may die. And Paul says, is that going to separate us from the love of Christ? And his answer is no, but he doesn't get there yet. The, first, the next thing that he does is, is quote Psalm 44, 22 for us in verse 36. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Isn't that an uplifting verse? I mean, that makes you want to go out and say, yes, all right. There, there, there's no uh, health and wealth, prosperity gospel in that verse. And that's exactly why Paul uses it. Because what he's saying is, from Old Testament to New Testament, the people of God go through suffering. Life is not easy. We do get squeezed from things outside and inside us, and we do suffer persecution, and we do suffer through other kinds of trials. And so all of that is a reality. He wants us to understand that because that gives meaning to the next verse. When he says, no, those don't separate us from the love of God. In all these things, there's that phrase again, by the way, all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When he asks the question, can these things separate us 
from the love of Christ. What he's asking us is, can they divorce us from God's love? And that's actually what the word separate means. That's why I used the word divorce, because that was the word that was used in Greek culture for a divorce. And so that's really what Paul is saying. Can circumstances and people and struggles and suffering cause God to walk out of my life or cause me to lose my relationship with Him? No, he says. In all of these things, all of these things that God is working together for our growth in Christ likeness and His glory, we are more than conquerors. English doesn't have a word that does it. The word really here in Greek is hyper-conquerors, super-conquerors. We are conqueror and conqueror and conqueror again. Probably the idea that we in Christ can conquer anything and not just conquer but have power over that. Not just subdue the country but rule the country. And Paul says in in all of these things that happen, we are hyper-conquerors. Not that we get out of them but because we know God is at work in them. And he is bringing about the good of Christ's likeness and his glory through them, then we know that we are winning in spite of the circumstances. He loved us, it says. Past tense, because he's reflecting back to what he's just talked about, the cross and what Christ did. But he loves us right now as well in this moment. In all these things, not some of these things, but all these things, we are more than conquerors. But notice, we are not more than conquerors because we are so tough. We are not more than conquerors because somehow we gritted our teeth and with great stoicism we persevered through the trials. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Not in our own strength, not in our own power, not even in our own definition of what it means to conquer, but through Him and His work in our lives. And so we have abundant victory in all of life's hardships. And so Paul says nothing can separate us, nothing can divorce God from His people. Nothing can do that. No one can do that. And he concludes the chapter and really this first major section of Romans in some ways, though he's going to continue a theme on to chapter 9 and 10, He concludes it with these words, For I am sure, I am confident. It's that perfect tense of a Greek verb again that we've talked about before, which which talks about that there's something in the past. I became sure before, and I am sure right now in this moment, and I am certain that I'm still going to be sure tomorrow and into the future. I am sure that neither death nor life, that is, Whether I die or whether I continue on in the struggles of this life, alive or dead, I belong to Jesus. Nor angels, nor rulers. And rulers there is probably not earthly rulers. He's thinking demonic powers. And so he's saying, no good angel, even if they wanted to, and no bad angel can separate me. Nor things present, nor things to come. That is, nothing that's happening right now. Nothing in that unknown future for us can separate us, nor powers. And there he just, he doesn't do the double there, he just does one. And again, the powers there could be earthly powers, but probably he's looking behind them to spiritual powers. Then he goes back to doubling. Nor height, nor depth, nothing in geography can separate me from God. Fifty years ago, mankind for the first time walked on the moon. God was there. If any of those two astronauts or those who followed them on the moon were followers of Jesus Christ, God loved them right there. He wasn't separated from them. Someday if we can travel to Mars, God's love will follow us there or wherever we go, height or depth, it doesn't matter. He's probably echoing Psalm 139 where there's no place we can escape the love of God nor anything else. He said, just in case some of you are thinking, oh, I found a loophole in what Paul said. He, he missed something. 
Paul says, nor anything else in all creation, okay? Nothing, no one, not you, not your neighbor, not your parents, not your kids, not your boss. No one and nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's a sweeping list, and it's the crescendo. In fact, I want you to read this, you all in Connections too. I want you to read it, but I want you to read it not like, for I am sure that neither death nor life. I want you to read it like Paul wrote it, all right, with confidence in your voice as we work our way through it. So join me in it. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is Paul's crescendo. It's his big conclusion to the chapter and to all that he said about the work of Christ. When I was in middle school and then high school, I played the French horn, and I still love the sound of French horn, though I haven't played it for a long time. But I remember there were times when we were playing a song and, and it called for a crescendo, for big sound, and, and we were just belting it out because there's nothing like a good French horn. And the director would say, stop, stop. <laughs> Horns, can you hold it back a little, please? In these verses, Paul's not holding back anything. He is saying that you and I who are followers of Jesus are so secure that absolutely nothing can break that security and divorce us from God. You may be rejected by people. You may be lied about by coworkers or family members. You may be disappointed. You may have broken promises or have made promises that you broke. You may be in a financial crisis, a critical illness. You may be wrestling with dementia or Alzheimer's. I want you to know that nothing covers all of those and anything else you can think of. Nothing covers them. Nothing can separate us. The last months of my dad's life, he was very confused. And we never really got a diagnosis for what it was, but he just was not himself at all. One of the worst nights of my life was spent with him in the hospital. To understand this, you'd have to understand that my dad was one of the most gentle, gracious men that you would ever meet, but not that night. He was combative. He was angry. I had to be there to try to help the nurses with him. And my sister, who wasn't there that night but spent the next night there, said, you know, he, he's destroying his testimony. And I said, no, no, he's not. First of all, they understand this isn't really him. And we know it's not really him. And the reality is that even in that moment and in the days of confusion ahead, when my dad didn't understand his faith in God anymore, he was still not separated from the love of God. And that's true for you. Whatever you are going through, whatever I go through, we are absolutely secure in Jesus Christ, but only in Him. And this morning, if you don't know Him, there is no security for you. It is only in Him. This great chapter begins, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and it ends with, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. No condemnation, no separation. Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus Christ is. Followers of Jesus Christ are secure. We are absolutely secure. There is nothing and no one that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. We're kind of like Forky. We may think we're trash, but we belong to the king of the universe, and nothing can change that. So you can boil down chapter 8, especially these verses, with this. God will never let go of his people. No one and no thing can change that. Because God is for us. 
in Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, thank you that you are for us. Thank you that our hope is not in what we can do or what we hope to do or what we might do. Thank you that our hope is not crushed by what we have done that is wrong. But then we, when we know Christ, because his work is finished, our future is secure. Thank you that in Christ alone, our hope is found. That he is indeed the only foundation for life and for faith. Lord, if there's anyone here or anyone in connections that does not know him as Savior, I pray that before they leave today, they would settle that. For the rest of us, Father, when we go through those hard days, when we think we're trash, help us to remember we belong to you. When we feel like maybe you're going to walk out of our lives, you're going to give up on us, you're going to quit to remember that you never will, that you are always for us in Christ. Thank you that we are hyper-conquerors through him who loved us so much that he went to the cross for us. It's in his name we pray.